Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another session of the 24th Goldman Sachs European Financials Conference. This year's conference was supposed to be in Rome, um, but this year we will literally bring Rome to your home. I'm today accompanied by Mr. Daniele Franco for this recording, and as far as I know, he's definitely sitting in Rome at the Bank of Italy, and we will have the pleasure to listen to his uh, comments and thoughts about the current situation through this recording. So first and foremost, Mr. Franco, thank you very much for making the time to participate to this conference today. I know your schedule is busy. I know the central banks around Europe are extremely busy, so we appreciate greatly you taking some time away from your, from your diary to, to be here with us today. Now, I just wanted to make a brief summary of your career. I'm sure I'm not going to do justice to it because it's very long and illustrious, but I'd highlight that you're currently the senior deputy governor of the Bank of Italy and president of the Insurance Supervisory Authority since January 1st, 2020. Um, you have a long career starting at the Bank of Italy in 1979, but also including important roles at the European Commission's Directorate General for Economic and Financial Affairs, as head of the public division of the Economic Research Department, in Italy, State Accountant General, and in the field of academia, published books on public spending, social protection systems, European tax rule, and many other subjects. So a very rich breadth of experience. I know that on all of these topics you have thought that you wanted to share with us. So I leave the floor to you now. And again, thank you very much for participating to this conference today. Well, thank you very much for inviting me in this kind of unusual uh, context. Hopefully in future years, we will go back to more normal uh, conferences and meetings. But so anyway, I'm glad to contribute in this way. Um, how would you like me to get started? Absolutely, go ahead and share with us your initial thoughts. Uh, okay, I think uh, um, we are living very unusual times uh, and uh, let me mention what uh, we did uh, at the bank uh, in recent uh, uh, months uh, to cope with uh, uh, this unusual crisis and then I'll say something about Italy's uh, uh, economic uh, context very briefly. Uh, I think uh, um, the shock uh, is indeed, uh, uh, the virus shock has indeed been uh, large and uh, unexpected. At the bank, uh, we had uh, at the end of February, beginning of May, two main concerns. Uh, first, to ensure that uh, employees uh, were not affected by the virus. Second, uh, to make sure that uh, services uh, were provided to the public uh, uh, in a full uh, way. Um, so by means of services, I'm referring to monetary policy operations, supervision, statistics, economic analysis, the payment system, uh, public debt management. So we wanted to make sure that everything worked uh, well. Uh, in the space of about 10 days, uh, we moved about 90% of our uh, colleagues uh, from, working, from working at the office uh, to working at home. The process uh, was rather smooth. Uh, in the end, it was easier than we expected uh, in the very beginning, uh, uh, basically because the technology was already uh, there. Uh, we did not suffer any significant cuts in our output uh, and all departments uh, were always fully operational. If uh, you read our annual report, uh, which we released uh, at the end of May, you would not think that it was produced by colleagues, uh, uh, economists uh, working from home. Uh, we are now planning a gradual return to uh, normality, which uh, will depend on the evolving uh, health uh, uh, as well as on government uh, decisions and policies. But uh, an important point here is that uh, the experience uh, we are uh, getting from these uh, a strange new context, uh, I think will be very useful in uh, designing the future organization of work at the bank. Uh, um, I think we will draw a lot of uh, uh, indication, but this applies to the Bank of Italy, but I guess also to many other institutions and companies. 
uh, moving to broader uh, issues, uh, why the public health situation in Italy is gradually improving, uh, the economic situations uh, uh, remain very difficult. Italy recorded a fall of a GDP of around 5% in the first quarter. And uh, we expect uh, an even bigger decline in the second quarter. For 2020, we expect a reduction of GDP in the range of 9 to 13%. Um, there is obviously a lot of uh, uncertainty, uh, which uh, uh, reflects uh, the fact that uh, uh, health uh, developments are very much uh, uncertain. Now things are, as I said, uh, improving fast, but I mean, uh, hopefully this will continue, but uh, certainly nobody is sure or certain about that. Um, the government's uh, um, macroeconomic outlook uh, envisages a deficit of around 10% for this year and uh, an increase in the debt to GDP ratio of about uh, 20 points, uh, uh, meaning that Italy will have at the end of the year a, de a debt ratio, debt to GDP ratio of about 156 points, that is very high. Um, Larger fiscal measures have been implemented uh, by the government to support households and companies uh, and to sustain the recovery. As uh, everyone knows, uh, the uh, important monetary policy decisions have been taken by the ECB and uh, EU institutions are also acting uh, in order to provide financial support to countries uh, by uh, the crisis. Um, we expect the economy to pick up uh, uh, in the second part of this year and to accelerate uh, thereafter. For next year, we uh, expect GDP to grow at about 5%. Uh, um, now, uh, as it is well known, Italy's growth over the past decades uh, have been uh, rather uh, disappointing. Uh, that's for a number of uh, reasons. Uh, and uh, we have a number of weak points. Uh, for instance, we know that uh, doing business indicators are rather unsatisfactory. The tax uh, rates on labor are rather high. Uh, the ratio of investment to GDP is lower now than it was in past decades, uh, and the size of companies is relatively small. On the other hand, uh, we are aware that uh, Italy has a number of uh, uh, points of strength, uh, like the flexibility of the manufacturing, export, manufacturing sector, the capacity to uh, export, uh, uh, the relatively low uh, debt, uh, both of households and uh, uh, companies, uh, uh, the big trade uh, surplus, which is about uh, 3% of GDP, and it is still high also in structural terms. So uh, overall, uh, we think that uh, now it is uh, crucial that Italy exploits uh, this uh, unexpected and painful shock due to the virus to overcome the main obstacles to uh, growth. This is in a nutshell, I mean, a, a rather a quick picture of the Italian economy right now. Okay, thank you for these remarks, uh, Mr. Franco. Look, the first topic I wanted to address with you, which I think is the elephant in the room, is the Italian debt sustainability. As you said yourself, the GDP, uh, the debt to GDP ratio is likely to reach close to 160% at the end of this year. And whilst many economists expect a snapback very rapid for GDP growth next year, there is also a risk in many people's opinion that the high debt ratio of Italy might necessitate more austerity as was the case before and risk hampering that rapid recovery, further putting pressure on debt sustainability. What is your opinion? Um, well, I say that I would exclude that uh, the risk that you mentioned will materialize in 2020 and 21. This for a number of reasons. Uh, well, in principle, a contractionary fiscal policy in Italy might be triggered either by the need to respect uh, the common fiscal rules uh, 
or by tensions in the sovereign debt market. Now, concerning the rules, uh, the EU Commission uh, made clear that member states uh, uh, will be granted significant budgetary flexibility for as long as the crisis persists. Uh, actually, Italy will be able to access uh, uh, to, to a significant amount of EU resources. So contrary to previous crises, at this time EU institutions are contributing to expanding, uh, not restricting EU Italy's uh, uh, fiscal uh, space. Concerning the fear of market turmoil, uh, let me first mention that the worst months uh, in terms of uh, public liquidity needs uh, are behind us. Uh, and even during these months, uh, the increased state financing needs uh, were accommodated uh, in an orderly uh, way. Moreover, the ACB schemes, uh, the PPP and the APP are stabilizing the financial markets uh, while assuring a very easy monetary uh, stance. Finally, in the coming quarters, uh, Italian sovereign spread would also reflect the availability of the new EU level uh, financial instrument. So uh, for all these reasons, we think that uh, the coming uh, quarter, let's say, will be on a relatively uh, safe uh, path. Uh, Italy's uh, public debt to GDP ratio is uh, high, it's uh, very high, but the cost of the debt is low and it is still declining. In 2019, the average interest rate on our debt was 2.5%, and uh, we are now issuing a 10 years bond at 1.5%. This implies a further reduction in the average interest rate. Um, so this makes uh, the uh, situation uh, uh, less uh, worrisome than would be implied but just by looking at a very high uh, debt ratio. Obviously, uh, Italy should not be complacent. Uh, Italy should implement a medium-term program for the reduction of the debt ratio. Uh, this implies that Italy should focus, as I said earlier, on growth enhancing economic policies. And second, Italy should uh, target and maintain a primary surplus, uh, like Italy did in past years. Uh, and the primary surplus level should be sufficiently larger to reduce the debt ratio. Uh, in our annual report, you find, may find some simulation pointing to a surplus of at least 1.5% on average. So reducing the debt ratio to a safer level will require a strong and protracted commitment by Italian policymakers, but I believe uh, it can be achieved without excessively harsh uh, measures. Okay, now coming to bias of that debt, banks and insurance companies have, have been and are a key source of demand for sovereign bonds but many of them have expressed their willingness to rebalance their investment portfolio going forward, slightly away from Italian debt and BTPs. How do you see the execution of this balancing act between large issuance needs and conservative or more conservative and diversified investment strategies by the key buyers? Well, before the start of the epidemic, uh, Italian banks were gradually reducing the stock of Italian government securities in their portfolios. Uh, between March uh, 2019 and January 2020, banks uh, sold almost 40 billion of government bonds. That is, the, from a peak of more than 400 billion in 2015, uh, uh, government bonds held by Italian banks uh, had to come down to 315. Uh, in recent months, uh, as you said, uh, uh, net purchases of sovereign bonds by Italian banks uh, have resumed. Uh, between February and April, they increased by 46 uh, uh, billion. 
to a total now of about 360 billion. And this because of the new market tension relating to the epidemic, but also to the fact that banks uh, uh, consider that uh, uh, a good thing to do, buying uh, uh, bonds with a high, a relatively high yield. So uh, the stock of bonds uh, still represents uh, less than 10% of uh, banks' uh, total assets. And, and uh, this percentage is even lower for the largest uh, uh, Italian banks. Uh, there is certainly a need for some balancing, as you mentioned, between the Italian treasury issuance needs uh, on the one hand uh, and banks' uh, prudent investment strategies on the other, but uh, I believe that this remain, uh, remains manageable. Uh, banks, uh, for instance, uh, have allocated a large part of recent uh, purchases to their cost amortized portfolio, which means that future variations uh, in bond prices uh, will not impact on banks' uh, uh, regulatory capital. Uh, moreover, uh, the risks uh, uh, arising from excessive volatility in government bond prices uh, will be mitigated by the ECB uh, programs, uh, especially by the PPP, which uh, was uh, strengthened just like a week last week uh, by increasing its total amount to 1,350 billion euro and extending its duration until at least uh, mid-2021. Uh, um, at the same time, the ECB Governing Council has confirmed that purchases will, be, will continue to be conducted uh, in a flexible manner over time across asset classes uh, and among jurisdictions to stave off risks uh, to the smooth uh, transmission of monetary policy. As for insurance companies, while the sharp drop uh, in the prices of financial assets, including sovereign bonds, uh, and the rise in their volatility have led to a reduction in their solvency ratio. Uh, their capital remain well above the regulatory minimum. And this allows them to act uh, uh, once again as a shock absorber rather than as a shock uh, amplifier. Obviously, after this emergence, it is likely that banks and insurance companies companies in Italy will uh, once again reduce the stocks of Italian government bonds, so balancing will resume uh, after the crisis. Excellent. Now moving on to the latest European Commission's proposal for a European recovery fund. This is supposed to be funded, at least there is a project for it, by a federal tax, and its aim is to redistribute through grants and this appears to have the key elements for deeper integration of European finances. This is in response to the COVID crisis, and some probably see this as a one-off. But do you believe that this is the beginning of some sort of a new paradigm for European and therefore Italian state finances? Well, uh, if you look at the history of the European Union, uh, um, you can see uh, sudden accelerations in integration in between period of uh, stability. So this is likely to be another phase of acceleration in the, in the integration process. Um, you may remember the Monet prophecy that European integration will, will be forged uh, in crisis and will be the sum of the solutions uh, adopted for those crises. Um, so the Bank of Italy has uh, repeatedly stressed that uh, the EU economic uh, framework is incomplete and that some form, some kind of common fiscal capacity is necessary in the medium term. This capacity would protect member states from uh, the impact of idiosyncratic shocks and complement monetary policy in the event of severe common uh, shocks. Well, the new uh, EU fiscal instruments such as the recovery fund uh, represent a big step uh, forward in that uh, direction. The importance uh, of this fund is uh, twofold. First, uh, uh, 
what it will, one should look at what uh, it uh, will uh, finance. And second, uh, one should look at how it is uh, raised. And here we see the recognition of a collective responsibility and the first steps toward a proper uh, fiscal union. Basically, the EU is uh, creating a kind of uh, federal debt. And this allows the EU to run a small federal deficit uh, to stabilize the economy uh, in the current uh, uh, downturn. This also implies some redistribution between those who receive the resources and those who will repay the debt. Now, uh, we will see in the coming years whether this is a major step uh, forward or it is only a temporary solution. Uh, if uh, we look uh, at uh, uh, past European history, I would tend to believe uh, that it is the former that is uh, a kind of step forward. How big it is, we will see in the coming years. Excellent. Switching tack and moving on to another remit of the bank, which is the stability of the banking system. Italian banks are very domestic. There is little foreign participation in the banking system, and the banks have historically have a fairly low profitability in a European context. So my first question here is, what is the most likely scenario that the Bank of Italy envisages for the rise in NPLs following the contraction in GDP? Is it possible that we go back to the previous peaks, or do you see the state guarantees, particularly for corporate loans, as uh, a strong tool with regards to protecting the bank's balance sheets? Uh, let me comment first on your first comment, uh, comment uh, um, the one about the Italian banking system being very domestic. Uh, uh, well, before the global financial crisis, uh, the, values, uh, the value of cross-border M&As in Europe reached their peak, uh, and Italian banks, I'm referring especially to Intesa and Unicredit, uh, uh, significantly expanded their presence uh, in uh, Europe, uh, uh, in continental Europe and Eastern Europe, uh, while some major Italian uh, intermediaries uh, uh, were acquired by foreign intermediaries, and specifically French intermediaries. Uh, therefore, at least when it comes to the largest institution, the Italian banking system is uh, fairly open. Um, then the process of pan-European integration uh, in the banking sector uh, came to a halt uh, with the global financial crisis in 2008. Uh, the economic environment was clearly not favorable to cross-border M&As. Weak economic growth led to subdued bank profitability, this in Italy as well in other European countries. So afterwards, uh, the banking union project has uh, somehow revived the integration process. Uh, but we are still far from a fully integrated banking market, also because the banking union itself is still incomplete. So I think the issue then is not just Italian, but it has a European dimension, as uh, it has also been pointed out by the ECB. And I believe that a completion of the banking union could work as a catalyst for future cross-border uh, consolidation. Uh, coming now to your question, well, the financial structure of Italian corporates is much sounder now than it was during the Lehman crisis and the sovereign debt crisis. Uh, the share of debt held by vulnerable firms, that is firms with either a negative operating income or very burdensome interest expenses was 29% of the total debt at the end of 2018. It was 44% in 2007, much, much bigger. Uh, according to our estimate, the share of vulnerable debts could reach the peak recorded in the previous uh, crisis between 2008 and 2011-12, only if uh, uh, profits uh, in 2020s were to, be, uh, to decline by 50% which is a reduction much bigger than the one that we observed in 2009. So 
Despite the severity of uh, the COVID-19 crisis, uh, uh, this scenario seems unlikely uh, at the current juncture. According to the estimates uh, uh, prepared by my colleagues uh, here at the bank as part of the Eurosystem staff macroeconomic projection published a few days ago, even under the um, severe scenario of those uh, uh, projections, while the flow of new MPLs uh, would rise, uh, it would uh, remain much uh, below the values that were observed uh, during the Lema and the sovereign debt crisis. Uh, public loan guarantees uh, will help uh, to contain the amount of value adjustment, uh, both on, on new disbursement, on new loans, uh, and on outstanding loans uh, subject to renegotiations. It is, however, likely that in the coming months, the economic impact of the epidemic will appear on loans already classified as unlikely to pay, which benefit uh, to a very limited extent uh, from the, the measures introduced by the government, the guarantee measures introduced by the government. And uh, these loans uh, are about half of the net impaired loans on bank uh, uh, balance sheets. According to our simulations, if all uh, the unlikely to pay uh, loans were transformed into bad loans, that is in a very, I mean, kind of uh, harsh uh, scenario, the increase in the value adjustment would be approximately for the Italian banking system 15 billion, with an average reduction in better quality capital equal to 1.1% in terms of the risk weighted assets. So it would be a big impact, but still a manageable uh, impact. MPLs are less of a concern in the household uh, sector. At the end of last year, the yearly non-performing loan rate was at a very low level, about 1%. Uh, the share of household with a mortgage loan classified as vulnerable was about uh, 0.8% at the end of 2018. That is half uh, at the level of 2007 when it was 1.6%. Moreover, the share of new consumer loans granted to borrowers classified as high risk borrowers uh, fell from 9% in 2012 to 2% 2 in 2019, while the share of low risk loans arose uh, from uh, 36 to 48 percent. So on the household side, we are on a safer uh, ground. And uh, we are on a safer ground also because of a number of measures taken by the Italian government over the last few months, uh, supporting households' uh, ability to meet financial obligation, talking about uh, a debt moratorium and expansion in uh, unemployment benefits, uh, a temporary income support scheme for the self-employed and seasonal employees, uh, and finally the freezing of layoffs uh, in the Italian private sector. So the system, as you pointed out, has started to consolidate under the impetus of the Renzi reform in 2015. Since then, the consolidation has happened mostly through distressed transactions. Um, and even in what was a more normal environment, domestic players even earlier in the year have been resisting consolidation appeals. How desirable or likely is further consolidation in the system? Uh, well, first, let me mention that uh, uh, some consolidation has already taken place in recent years, notwithstanding the difficult economic environment. Uh, for instance, as a follow up uh, of the reforms of the larger cooperative banks, uh, what we call the Banca Popolari, two of them uh, merged and created one of the largest banks in the country, Banco BPM. Uh, moreover, an important reform of the mutual banking sector, what we call the Banque di Credito Cooperativo, was enacted and implemented. Since last year, more than 200 small neutral banks uh, have been operating under the umbrella of two large uh, cooperative banking groups, the CREA and Casa Centrale Banca. So this has uh, uh, significantly uh, strengthened the sector. Now we have in Italy 98 individual banks and 55 groups uh, with uh, 
12, the 12 groups uh, owning about 80% of the overall assets. Uh, the system has become more concentrated than it was in the past. About 10 years ago, we had about 700 uh, banks. A further operation uh, is currently underway following the public offer announced by Intesa San Paolo for the acquisition of uh, UBI Bank. Um, the, the Bank of Italy and the ECB have uh, positively assessed this operation from a supervisory perspective. The process now requires the authorization of IVAS. IVAS is the insurance sector regulator. Uh, then there is a need uh, for the authorization of CONSOB, which is the market regulator and the antitrust authority. The antitrust authority in a recent uh, preliminary assessment has uh, raised some concerns about uh, possible threats uh, to competition in the market. So we will see how these concerns will be uh, dealt with and considered. Um, so, a process of consolidation is underway even right now and uh, uh, in our annual report we published uh, uh, a study concerning uh, potential gains from consolidation in the Italian banking sector pointing to the fact that uh, there are still margins uh, useful uh, efficient margin for consolidation um, so in this uh, in-depth analysis uh, that you, you can find in chapter 13 of our annual report, uh, we show that uh, uh, increasing uh, the operating scale of Italian banks uh, can lead uh, to significant uh, efficiency gains, uh, specifically uh, the marginal cost of the production and distribution of highly standardized uh, services for which the use of new technologies is important, such as payment services and deposits, significantly decrease as volumes increase. On the other hand, the study shows that economies of scale are rather limited for the provisions of loan and for investment advice for which the use of new technologies so far has been more limited. Uh, overall, a growth uh, in the scale of production uh, by uh, M&As or platform for sharing products and services could result uh, in substantial efficiency gains for small and medium-sized uh, Italian banks, especially if accompanied by restructuring of uh, the branch network and by more widespread adoption of new technologies. For larger banks, a further benefit from economies of scale on the cost side seems to be concentrated on a business models that focus on high product diversification and operate with a relatively small number of branches. Okay. And lastly, on the banks, I just wanted to ask you, we've now suspended the resolution and recovery directive, and essentially bail-ins have been eliminated as a crisis response to Yet the COVID pandemic might create capital needs for certain banks. Some of them were already vulnerable, some smaller institutions and fewer than before, but still some of them are still vulnerable and being closely monitored. How prepared is the state to help further if needed at a time when the rest of the banks might not be ready to shoulder more costs as they are also dealing with their own balance sheet pressures? Um, as uh, the governor, Governor Visco, explained when presenting our annual report uh, a few days ago, Italian banks are facing the current crisis uh, from a stronger position than the one uh, they were before the double deep recession, double deep recession of 2008-2013. Uh, the ratio of the highest uh, uh, loss absorbing capital, C81, to risk weighted assets uh, rose from 7% in 2007 to nearly 14% uh, last December, December 2019. Uh, moreover, balance sheets have been cleared of most non performing loans, uh, which have fallen by two thirds uh, over the last four years. 
uh, notwithstanding this process, progress, the depths of the recession will inevitably uh, affect uh, banks' uh, uh, balance sheets in the coming years, especially those of some banks. Uh, um, the increase in non-performing loans will have to be dealt with in a timely manner using all available instruments, including tools for the and uh, sale on the market. And uh, should it prove necessary, we must uh, stand ready to explore a solution to safeguard the system stability, considering the use of preventive tools to help banks uh, that are facing uh, uh, severe, also temporary difficulties. Records to public funds to support banks uh, have been relatively lower in Italy over the last, uh, let's say, 15 years uh, than in other developed uh, countries. However, when necessary, the Italian government uh, uh, has undertaken effective intervention in support of the financial system. So I trust that uh, if necessary, our government uh, will again take effective uh, measure. And uh, by the way, we welcome uh, the recent uh, measure, recently introduced measure taken by, taken by the Italian the Italian government to facilitate the orderly liquidation of uh, uh, small uh, banks. However, uh, we continue to be concerned about the inadequacy of the European bank crisis management uh, framework about which the governor and other colleagues uh, have spoken on many occasions. The main critical point is the lack of an orderly liquidation procedure for small and medium-sized banks, that is the vast majority of banks in the euro area. So progress on this front should be made soon in the context of the overall work on the completion of the banking union. Excellent. And look, my, my last topic is essentially the, the marriage of the two topics before. It's monetary policy transmission and banks. Over the past many years since the double deep recessions, the growth of performing credit at Italian banks has underperformed that of the more wider uh, spectrum of peers across the Eurozone, particularly France, to take one that I cover closely. Um, yet interest rates offered by bank on these loans have fallen significantly. And in many product cases, they've been on par with some of the um, interest rates offered in other countries. So. What do you attribute this lack of credit growth to considering those low interest rates? Is this a demand or a supply issue? Uh, we think it is basically um, a demand issue. So if uh, we look uh, at the period before the outbreak of uh, COVID-19, uh, lending growth to household was uh, solid, uh, positive, uh, uh, but uh, lending growth to non-financial corporation was uh, uh, negative. And this was mainly the result of low demand for loans uh, by firms in connection with uh, weak economic activity and investment. Overall, according to the Italian bank's reply to the Euro Area Bank Lending Survey, loan supply remained relaxed also thanks to the ECB uh, accommodative monetary policy stance. So uh, some signs, uh, some indications of uh, greater difficulties in assessing credit were only reported uh, by specific categories of firms, such as small companies uh, and those active uh, in the construction sector. Uh, since the outbreak uh, of the epidemic, uh, lending to firms uh, uh, has accelerated dramatically, uh, reflecting the higher demand uh, for loans uh, uh, connected with liquidity shortages uh, uh, and connected with the declining revenues uh, of uh, companies. On the contrary, lending to household has slowed down following the contraction in consumption expenditure uh, following uh, the decline in consumer confidence, uh, but and also following the decline in the, of uh, transaction in the real estate market. Very clear. Now, switching back slightly, but in terms of the provision of credit since the COVID outbreak, there are large corporate guarantees 
Italy has a very large program as well. Yet, when we look at the numbers which are floating around and being disclosed by the authorities, the take-up of these guaranteed loans in Italy seems to be fairly low in the context of what we can see elsewhere. Are banks cautious in granting those loans, or is it corporates being prudent on debt levels? What do you attribute this to? Uh, well, the slow take-up of public guarantees uh, a multiple uh, factor. Again, we examine these factor in our annual report. Uh, well, first, uh, one should consider that the volume of applications uh, has been uh, and still is uh, exceptionally high. Um, second, some banks uh, face the organizational problem. Third, uh, and most important, the procedures required for implementing the measures uh, are complex and involve uh, numerous actors. So basically, the government had to strike uh, a difficult balance between uh, conflicting needs. Uh, on one hand, the need to rapidly channel resources to companies uh, affected by the recession. On the other hand, the need to safeguard public finances, ensuring that guarantees do not extend to loans with a very high risk of default and are not susceptible to criminal use. So in the absence of any explicit regulatory provision, banks that fail to conduct a credit worthiness assessment expose themselves to the risk of committing a crime. Mm -hmm. Intermediaries are also required to carry out the control provided for by the anti-mafia and the anti-money -mon anti laundering legislation. So now these uh, aspects are going to be tackled with uh, some amendments uh, to le the uh, legislation, introducing uh, guarantees, uh, amendments which are under discussion in Parliament uh, uh, right now. Um, so this uh, will uh, uh, help, uh, uh, let's say, banks uh, in uh, uh, carry out a procedure in uh, in a faster, in a, in a speedy way. Um, so I'm confident that in the coming weeks, uh, with uh, these amendments, these changes to the recently introduced legislation on one side and the cooperation of all parties involved on the other side, uh, including obviously banks, uh, we will see substantial improvement in the flow of resources to uh, the economy. Actually, um, the flow of loans to company is increasing faster. Um, altogether, to facilitate firms' access to bank credit, public guarantees have been made available in the amount of five a uh, hundred billion euro, which is six times uh, the uh, amount of guarantees available at the end of 2019. Uh, we believe that this amount is quite large with respect to the potential demand for guaranteed loans by Italian uh, firms. Uh, we are monitoring uh, um, the process. Uh, there is uh, a task force uh, set up uh, by the Ministry of the Economy and Finance together with us and the Banking Association to monitor uh, the, uh, the execution of the new legislation uh, concerning guarantees. Uh, and uh, this tax force released uh, uh, a few days ago um, its uh, latest press release uh, pointing to the fact that uh, uh, the Central Guarantee Fund had received uh, at the beginning of June uh, about half a million applications uh, for a total sum of uh, 22 and a half billion uh, euro. Most of the application, 90% of these applications are for loans of up to 25,000 euro, that is more loans. Uh, for which uh, um, the state guarantee is 100%. But uh, we are monitoring the process and we expect to see, uh, we see some progress and we think that uh, uh, the situation will improve fast in the coming weeks. Okay, so my last question is very simple at the end is, and it takes into account all of your answers so far. So do you believe that an economy such as Italy 
which is intermediated mostly by comparatively smaller scale domestic banks that can have the same that can they have the same effect in supporting the economy not only in the crisis but also in its recovery and how do you see the prospect of banks and capital markets union from an italian perspective how useful would direct lending by the central bank as in the us be at this stage particularly taking into account your last remark about the speed of processing by banks which might have been slower than you might have expected well i mean uh, the development of uh, financial markets in italy reflects uh, the characteristic of the economic system reflects the structure of the economy uh, we have an economy with uh, very many small and medium sized companies so the small size uh, of our non financial firms is mirrored by the side of the banks uh, then the reliance of small firms on bank credit as a source of external finance uh, contributes to limiting the scope of market based finance so small and medium sized uh, uh, companies uh, and uh, bigger role for bank and a smaller role for the financial market uh, however over the last decade uh, depths uh, of financial markets uh, uh, have increased uh, recourse to bonds and equity uh, uh, has increased uh, and these developments uh, uh, also reflect uh, the significant uh, measure taken by government to strengthen and diversify firms of financial uh, structures in particular uh, it tax, uh, tax and regulatory barriers to the issuance of bonds uh, were removed. A tax credit uh, for listed SMEs was introduced. Uh, an allowance for corporate equity, which reduced the tax bias uh, in favor of debt, uh, was uh, introduced again, was introduced and abolished and introduced again. Uh, despite these developments, Italian financial market, as you said, remains small compared to those of other uh, large European countries. Uh, we think uh, it would be useful to have uh, uh, bigger and more complete uh, markets. But for specialized operators and specialized infrastructure to be profitable, uh, one would need larger and liquid uh, markets. So therefore, the project uh, of uh, the capital market union with uh, its uh, objectives of broadening non-bank sources of financing uh, and lowering barriers uh, to cross-border investment i think they are particularly useful for italy uh, to further develop the italian cap market finance furthermore the as you well know the ecb is providing direct support to the real economy through its uh, corporate sector purchase uh, program, uh, which uh, is in place uh, since uh, 2016, and uh, which uh, was extended uh, in March to include short-term commercial papers in its uh, purchases. Now, if uh, uh, you look at the United States, yes, I think, uh, there you have a different financial market, but also you have uh, a different economy. The measures adopted by the Federal Reserve uh, to directly support credit provision to uh, companies mainly reflect uh, the larger role of uh, capital markets uh, in uh, firms of financing there, and the need to provide access to credit in a period in which these markets have experienced severe financial threats. Uh, so it's a different economy. In the euro area, the combination of public guarantees on new loans and the set of a highly expansionary monetary policy measure adopted by the ECB have the same objective of supporting the flow of credit to firms, but they take into consideration the greater role of uh, uh, banks intermediation in business financing in the euro area so us and euro are two different uh, areas and you have to use different partially different tools excellent 
So this was very clear to me. I learned a lot today. Um, this bring my series of questions to, to its conclusion. I hope that um, you enjoyed the session as well. I wanted again to reiterate my thanks for having taken some of your precious time to be with us today. Um, I would hope that we will meet physically again very, very soon and to welcome you in person and shake your hands physically, not virtually, um, next year at our conference, which hopefully might, might be in Rome as well, who knows? Well, hopefully it will be in Rome as well, yes, yes. So thank you very much, uh, and let's uh, look uh, to future meetings uh, in a more normal uh, and pleasurable context. Uh, so thanks a lot. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Franco. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.